This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Annie Coleman in St. Louis, Missouri, in April 2006. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 28. By and by, it was getting up time, so I come down the ladder and started for downstairs. But as I come to the girl's room, the door was open, and I see Mary Jane settin' by her old hair trunk, which was open, and she'd been packin' things in it, getting ready to go to England. But she had stopped now with a folded gown in her lap, and had her face in her hands, crying. I felt awful bad to see it. Of course anybody would. I went in there and says, "'Miss Mary Jane, you can't abear to see people in trouble, "'and I can't, most always. "'Tell me about it.' "'So she done it, and it was the niggers. "'I just expected it. "'She said the beautiful trip to England was most about spoiled for her. "'She didn't know how she was ever going to be happy there, "'knowing the mother and the children weren't ever going to see each other no more.' and then busted out bitterer than ever, and flung up her hands, and says, "'Oh, dear, dear, to think they ain't ever going to see each other any more.' "'But they will, and inside of two weeks, and I know it,' says I. "'Laws, it was out before I could think, and before I could budge, she throws her arms around my neck and told me to say it again, say it again, say it again.' I see I had spoke too sudden and said too much and was in a close place. I asked her to let me think a minute, and she sat there, very impatient and excited and handsome, but looking kind of happy and eased up, like a person that's had a tooth pulled out. So I went to studying it out. I says to myself, I reckon a body that ups and tells the truth when he's in a tight place has taken considerable many risks, though I ain't had no experience and can't say for certain. But it looks so to me, anyway. And yet here's a case where I'm blessed if it didn't look to me like the truth is better and actually safer than a lie. I must lay it by in my mind and think it over some time or other. It's so kind of strange and unregular. I never see nothing like it. Well, I says to myself at last, I'm a-going to chance it. I'll up and tell the truth this time though it does seem most like settin' down on a keg of powder and touchin' it off just to see where you'll go to. Then I says, Miss Mary Jane, is there any place out of town a little ways where you could go and stay three or four days? Yes, Mr. Lothrop's. Why? Never mind why yet. If I'll tell you how I know the niggers will see each other again inside of two weeks, here in this house, and prove how I know it, "'Will you go to Mr. Lothrop's and stay four days?' Four days?' she says. "'I'll stay a year.' "'All right,' I says. "'I don't want nothing more out of you than just your word. "'I'd rather have it than another man's kiss the Bible.' "'She smiled and read it up very sweet, and I says, "'If you don't mind it, I'll shut the door and bolt it.' "'Then I come back and sat down and says, "'Don't you holler.' "'Just set still and take it like a man. "'I got to tell the truth, and you want to brace up, Miss Mary, "'cause it's a bad kind, and going to be hard to take, "'but there ain't no help for it. "'These uncles of yourn ain't no uncles at all. "'They're a couple of frauds, regular deadbeats. "'There, now we're over the worst of it. "'You can stand the rest middlin' easy.' "'It jolted her up like everything, of course, "'but I was over the shoal water now, so I went right along, her eyes a blazin' higher and higher all the time, and told her every blame thing, from where we first struck that young fool goin' up to the steamboat, clear through to where she flung herself on to the king's breast at the front door, and he kissed her sixteen or seventeen times. And then up she jumps with her face afire like sunset, and says, "'The brute! Come! Don't waste a minute! Not a second! "'We'll have them tarred and feathered and flung in the river,' says I. "'Certainly, but do you mean before you go to Mr. Lothrop's, or—' "'Oh, 
she says. What am I thinking about? she says and sat right down again. Don't mind what I said, please don't. You won't now, will you? Laying her silky hand on mine in that kind of a way that I said I would die first. I never thought I was so stirred up, she says. Now go on, and I won't do so any more. You tell me what to do, and whatever you say, I'll do it. Well, I says, it's a rough gang, them two frauds, and I'm fixed, so I got to travel with them a while longer, whether I want to or not. I'd rather not tell you why, and if you was to blow on them, this town would get me out of their claws, and I'd be all right, but there'd be another person that you don't know about who'd be in big trouble. Well, we got to save him, hain't we? Of course. Well, then, we won't blow on them. Saying them words put a good idea in my head. I see how maybe I could get me and Jim rid of the frauds, get them jailed here, and then leave. But I didn't want to run the raft in the daytime without anybody aboard to answer questions but me, so I didn't want the plan to begin work until pretty late tonight. I says, Miss Mary Jane, I'll tell you what we'll do, and you won't have to stay at Mr. Lothrop so long, nother. How far is it? A little short of four miles, right out in the country back here. Well, that'll answer. Now you go long out there and lay low till nine or half past tonight. And then get them to fetch you home again. Tell them you've thought of something. If you get here before eleven, put a candle in this window. And if I don't turn up, wait till eleven. And then if I don't turn up, it means I'm gone and out of the way and safe. Then you come out and spread the news around and get these beats jailed. Good, she says, I'll do it. And if it just happens so that I don't get away, but get took up along with them, You must up and say I told you the whole thing beforehand, and you must stand by me all you can. Stand by you, indeed I will. They shan't touch a hair of your head, she says, and I see her nostrils spread and her eyes snap when she said it, too. If I get away, I shan't be here, I says, to prove these rapscallions ain't your uncles, and I couldn't do it if I was here. I could swear they was beats and bummers, that's all, though that's worth something. Well, there's others can do that better than what I can, and there are people that ain't going to be doubted as quick as I'd be. I'll tell you how to find them. Give me a pencil and a piece of paper. There. Royal Nun Search, Bricksville. Put it away and don't lose it. When the court wants to find out something about these two, Let them send up to Bricksville and say they've got the men that played the royal nun such, and ask for some witnesses. Why, you'll have that entire town down here before you can hardly wink, Miss Mary, and they'll come a violin, too. I judged we had got everything fixed about right now, so I says, Just let the auction go right along and don't worry. Nobody don't have to pay for the things they buy till a whole day after the auction, on accounts of the short notice. And they ain't going out of this till they get that money. And the way we fixed it, the sale ain't going to count, and they ain't going to get no money. It's just like the way it was with the niggers. It weren't no sale, and the niggers will be back before long. Why, they can't collect the money for the niggers yet. They're in the worst kind of a fix, Miss Mary. Well, she says, I'll run down to breakfast now, and then I'll start straight for Mr. Lothrop's. Indeed, that ain't the ticket, Miss Mary Jane, I says. By no manner of means. Go before breakfast. Why? What did you reckon I wanted you to go at all for, Miss Mary? Well, I never thought, and come to think, I don't know. What was it? Why, it's because you ain't one of these leather faced people. I don't want no better book than what your face is. A body can sit down and read it off like coarse print. Do you reckon you can go and face your uncles when they come to kiss you good morning and never? There, there, don't. Yes, I'll go before breakfast. I'll be glad to. And leave my sisters with them? Yes, never mind about them. They've got to stand it yet a while. They might suspicion something if all of you was to go. I don't want you to see them, nor your sisters, nor nobody in this town. If a neighbor was to ask how was your uncles this morning, your face would tell something. 
"'No, you go right along, Miss Mary Jane, and I'll fix it with all of them. "'I'll tell Miss Susan to give your love to your uncles and say you've went away for a few hours "'to get a little rest and change, or to see a friend, and you'll be back tonight or early in the morning. "'Gone to see a friend is all right, but I won't have my love given to them.' "'Well, then, it shan't be. "'It was well enough to tell her so. "'No harm in it. "'It was only a little thing to do, and no trouble. "'And it's the little things that smooths people's roads most. "'Down here below, it would make Mary Jane comfortable, "'and it wouldn't cost nothing. "'Then I says, "'There's one more thing. "'That bag of money. "'Well, they've got that, "'and it makes me feel pretty silly to think how they got it. "'No, you're out there. They hain't got it. "'Why, who's got it? "'I wish I knowed, but I don't. "'I had it, because I stole it from them, "'and I stole it to give to you, and I know where I hid it. "'But I'm afraid it ain't there no more. "'I'm awful sorry, Miss Mary Jane. "'I'm just as sorry as I can be, but I done the best I could. "'I did, honest. "'I come nigh getting caught, and I had to shove it into the first place I come to and run— "'And it warn't a good place. "'Oh, stop blaming yourself. "'It's too bad to do it, and I won't allow it. "'You couldn't help it if it wasn't your fault. "'Where did you hide it?' "'I didn't want to set her to thinking about her troubles again, "'and I couldn't seem to get my mouth to tell her "'what would make her see that corpse laying in the coffin "'with that bag of money on his stomach. "'So for a minute I didn't say nothing. "'Then I says... "'I'd rather not tell you where I put it, Miss Mary Jane, "'if you don't mind letting me off, "'but I'll write it for you on a piece of paper, "'and you can read it along the road to Mr. Lothrop's if you want to. "'Do you reckon that'll do?' "'Oh, yes.' "'So I wrote. "'I put it in the coffin. "'I was in there when you was crying there, away in the night. "'I was behind the door, and I was mighty sorry for you, Miss Mary Jane.' It made my eyes water a little to remember her crying there all by herself in the night, and them devils laying there right under her own roof, shaming her and robbing her. And when I folded it up and give it to her, I see the water come into her eyes too, and she shook me by the hand hard, and says, "Goodbye. I'm going to do everything just as you've told me, and if I don't ever see you again, I shan't ever forget you." "'and I'll think of you a many and a many a time, "'and I'll pray for you, too.' "'And she was gone. "'Pray for me? "'I reckoned if she knowed me, "'she'd take a job that was more near her size. "'I bet she'd done it just the same. "'She was just that kind. "'She had the grit to pray for Judas if she took the notion. "'There warn't no back down to her, I judge. "'You may say what you want, too, "'but in my opinion... She had more sand in her than any girl I ever see. In my opinion, she was just full of sand. It sounds like flattery, but it ain't no flattery. And when it comes to beauty, and goodness too, she lays over them all. I hain't ever seen her since that time that I see her go out of that door. No, I hain't ever seen her since. But I reckon I've thought of her a many and a many a million times, and of her saying she would pray for me. "'and if ever I'd a thought it would do any good for me to pray for her, "'blamed if I wouldn't have done it or bust. "'Well, Mary Jane, she lit out the back way, I reckon, "'because nobody see her go. "'When I struck Susan in the hair lip, I says, "'What's the name of them people over on the other side of the river "'that y'all goes to see sometimes?' "'They says, "'There's several, but the proctors mainly.' "'That's the name,' I says. "'I most forgot it. "'Well, Miss Mary Jane, she told me to tell you she's gone over there in a dreadful hurry. "'One of them's sick.' "'Which one?' "'I don't know. Least a ways I kinder forget, but I think it's—' "'Sakes alive! I hope it ain't Hanner!' "'I'm sorry to say it,' I says. "'But Hanner's the very one.' "'My goodness! And she's so well only last week. Is she took bad?' "'It ain't no name for it.' They sit up with her all night, Miss Mary Jane said, and they don't think she'll last many hours. Only think of that. Now, what's the matter with her? I couldn't think of anything reasonable right off that way, so I says, Mumps. 
Mum's sure, Granny. They don't set up with people that's got the mumps. They don't, don't they? You better bet they do with these mumps. These mumps is different. It's a new kind, Miss Mary Jane said. How's it a new kind? Because it's mixed up with other things. What other things? Well, measles and whooping cough and erysipelas and consumption and yaller janders and brain fever and I don't know what all. My land! And they call it the mumps? That's what Miss Mary Jane said. Well, what in the nation do they call it the mumps for? Why, because it is the mumps. That's what it starts with. Well, there ain't no sense in it. A body might stump his toe and take poison and fall down the well and break his neck and bust his brains out, and somebody come along and ask what killed him, and some numb skull up and say, Why, he stumped his toe. Would there be any sense in that? No. And there ain't no sense in this, nother. Is it catching? Is it catching? Why, how you talk? Is a harrow catching in the dark? If you don't hitch onto one tooth, you're bound to one another, ain't you? And you can't get away with that tooth without fetching the whole harrow along, can you? Well, these kind of mumps is a kind of a harrow, as you may say, and it ain't no slouch of a harrow, nother. You come to get it hitched on good. Well, it's awful, I think, said the hare lip. I'll go to Uncle Harvey, and. Oh, yes, I says. I would. Of course I would. I wouldn't lose no time. Well, why wouldn't you? Just look at him a minute, and maybe you can see. Ain't your uncles obliged to get along home to England as fast as they can? And do you reckon they'd be mean enough to go off and leave you to go all that journey by yourselves? You know they'll wait for you. So far, so good. Your uncle Harvey's a preacher, ain't he? Very well, then. Is a preacher going to deceive a steamboat clerk? Is he going to deceive a ship clerk so as to get them to let Miss Mary Jane go aboard? Now you know he ain't. What will he do then? Why, he'll say, It's a great pity, but my church matters has got to get along the best they can, for my niece has been exposed to the dreadful pluribus unum mumps, and so it's my bounden duty to sit down here and wait the three months it takes to show on her if she's got it. But never mind, if you think it's best to tell your Uncle Harvey, Shucks, and stay fooling around here when we could all be having a good time in England whilst we was waiting to find out whether Mary Jane's got it or not? Why, you talk like a muggins. Well, anyway, maybe you'd better tell some of the neighbors. Listen at that now. You do beat all for natural stupidness. Can't you see that they'd go and tell? There ain't no way but just not to tell anybody at all. Well, maybe you're right. Yes, I judge you are right. But I reckon we ought to tell Uncle Harvey she's gone out for a while anyway, so he won't be uneasy about her. Yes, Miss Mary Jane, she wanted you to do that. She says, Tell them to give Uncle Harvey and William my love and a kiss, and say I've run over the river to see Mr. Mr. What is the name of that rich family your Uncle Peter used to think so much of? I mean, the one that. Why, you must mean the Apthorpes, ain't it? Of course, bother them kind of names. A body can't ever seem to remember them half the time, somehow. Yes, she said, say she is run over to ask the Apthorpes to be sure and come to the auction and buy this house, because she allowed her Uncle Peter would rather they had it than anybody else, and she's going to stick to them till they say they'll come. And then, if she ain't too tired, she's coming home. And if she is, she'll be home in the morning anyway. She said, don't say nothing about the Proctors, but only about the Apthorpes, which will be perfectly true because she is going there to speak about their buying the house. I know it because she told me so herself. All right, they said, and cleared out to lay for their uncles and give them the love and the kisses and tell them the message. Everything was all right now. The girls wouldn't say nothing because they wanted to go to England, and the king and the duke would rather Mary Jane was off working for the auction. Then around in reach of Dr. Robinson. I felt very good. I judged I had done it pretty neat. I reckon Tom Sawyer couldn't have done it no neater himself. Of course, he would have thrown more style into it, but I can't do that very handy, not being brung up to it. 
"'Well, they held the auction in the public square, "'along towards the end of the afternoon, "'and it strung along and strung along, "'and the old man, he was on hand, "'and looking his level poisonest, "'up there alongside of the auctioneer, "'and chipping in a little scripture now and then, "'or a little goody-goody saying of some kind, "'and the duke, he was around goo-going for sympathy, "'all he knowed how, "'and just spreading himself generally.' But by and by the thing dragged through and everything was sold, everything but a little old trifling lot in the graveyard. So they've got to work that off. I never see such a garrapt as the king was for wanting to swallow everything. Well, whilst they was at it, a steamboat landed, and in about two minutes up comes a crowd of whooping and yelling and laughing and carrying on and singing out, Here's your opposition line. "'Here's your two sets of heirs to old Peter Wilkes, "'and you pays your money, and you takes your choice.'" End of chapter 28